We're live. All the way from Lake Placid, New York. Buenos dias, mi gente. Great morning, people. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, this morning, we have a special guest that she's going to be talking to us about her mental health struggles. And we're going to be talking about how mindfulness comes into place. Oh, Anna, can you check real life? Just because I'm, sure. <laughs> I'm such a rookie at this. I want to make sure that people no, are it's great. Oh, no, he actually says uh, it's private. Why is he keep doing that? But we're going to fix that up right now for the public because we do want the public to join us. Right. Here we go. Now it's, <laughs> now it's public. Buenos oh. dias, mi gente. Gracias por... Unirse a nosotros esta mañana. Thank you for joining it this morning. I have an exciting uh, guest this morning that she's going to be chatting away with us about her mental health struggle and how mindfulness can help people um, deal with all these challenges that mental health bring to all of us. So without further ado, I want to introduce you Anna Roundsville. Anna is a common curator she, for Streamlight services, she actually helped people that are doing stream lining, stream, streaming lining like I am. Live. I'm streaming. <laughs> I know that's like a compound word for me, talking about mental health. It's like, <laughs> like having two twins talking about the same time. So she actually helps people when they are live streaming live like I'm doing right now. She's a common curator and she's an expert in this field. And I want to welcome and she's going to be sharing us a little bit of her story about her success, her struggle, her trials and tribulation in managing mental health and thriving and living an exciting life and doing all these wonderful things that she does. Uh, stream, you know, helping all this live streamer like me. So, good morning, Anna. Thank you for joining me this morning. How are you today? So, good take morning, it away. Yvonne. Hi, good morning, Yvonne. This is this is quite the treat to be able to be on here and to to be of service in this way. It just feels like with the we're in week twenty two or twenty three or something in in New York State. Uh, we're in, I'm in upstate New York. You're five hours from me uh, in Lake Placid, and trying to figure out. How, you know, trying to navigate mental health when all the rules have changed, it feels like. It feels like the whole world is just a little bit different than it was in April. And um, so I've had it, been dealing with, you know, my own mental health and my son's. Um, he's been having some difficulty. I have three kids. It's my middle child. Um, and... Uh, just things like anxiety and stuff. He's an extrovert and having to be penned in for so long um, and not see his, a lot of his friends and stuff was, has been difficult. And so now he's now he's navigating, you know, how to do, you know, the adulting thing while doing dealing with mental health stuff and the language and how to function on, on medicines and he had an allergic reaction uh, the other day and so um, we were at the hospital. Actually he was at the hospital, two different hospitals, one in the morning and a different one in the afternoon because the first one pegged that it was an allergic reaction to his medicine. Uh, they didn't do anything about it. So the second hospital noticed that he was having a um, a specific reaction to a medicine and that was making him grimace and and do all kinds of weird things with his body and his face and uh, uh he's the exact age range for this to happen he's a young uh, the, the some of the risk factors are male uh young and uh and and so he's it, it the the doctor had seen it before it wasn't a rare thing so He's just had to have some Benadryl at the hospital and it started to get better right there. So that was good. That was the other day. What day is it? Wednesday now? It's just made the week's really long lately. <laughs> um, yeah, so he he had to navigate. We're navigating his medicines and how to talk to his doctors and what he needs to ask and say and how to prioritize what to say. Um, we both have ADHD, so sometimes we can not, you know, it's hard to stay on focus, um, which is probably what I'm doing now. 
did I did I yeah so I've had I've had 18 years of being of dealing with mental illness um uh I was I had two manic episodes where I forgot how to sleep for a week each wow. time yeah and so when you present in a hospital with that they throw every back then they threw everything in the kitchen sink at you to make it stop so i was highly medicated on a lot of different <laughs> things i remember once i couldn't touch i couldn't feel my hand touching my face i was that legally stoned on all this stuff that <laughs> they threw at medication you. that's all the medicine to make it stop yeah so Anna, but it's not bipolar it's yeah, yeah. Let me, that's an interesting aspect that you share because, like you say, when people experience all kinds of anxiety or the mind ranging with negative thoughts or with fear, frustration, anger, and uh, and they seek some kind of medical help, like you said, uh, at the time while they get diagnosed, they get heavily medicated. So I wanted to ask you something. I mean, you I get such a, a little bit better now. When I first got dealt with this well when i first dealt with this my eldest was a year and a half they're now 25. so it's been some time and it seems like the medical community is is becoming more aware of trying to throw less stuff at you to make it stop my son didn't have nearly he didn't get as bad as i was um he just was really anxious all the time and was worried about stuff so they gave him different medicines and even one of those medicines which was a uh, um a shot is giving him the reaction that he's been having since monday um he we had to give him we we're bringing him benadryl so that that will not keep doing it um, now so Lana, Anna, let me ask you something. These are, are very interesting um, stuff that you are sharing. How your you and your son were both managing within your family all these challenges that you have with mental health. And I know they're all transitional, as we know. So let me ask you something. What are what are the triggering factors that, for example, for you and your son, uh, what do you believe is kind of like the triggering cause when? Perhaps you guys going through one of these challenges that might not be settled, you know, is um, what happened to me was um, what happens to me in general is it's a manic reaction to a traumatic event. Um, for 18 years, I was on medicines because they thought it was bipolar, but it wasn't uh, that I had a, there was a second psychiatrist in the practice who talked to the first psychiatrist and said, hmm, maybe it's not bipolar because it wasn't responding properly to years of medicines and I was compliant and everything and it just wasn't doing it. So the thing was I had, as a child, I had a, um, a difficult childhood. Um, my mother also dealt with mental illness. Her, her thing, um, seems to be schizophrenia. That's the big granddaddy one that you don't want. <laughs> you don't want your <laughs> friends to have, you know, that's just, it's a hard pill to swallow because, you know, they hear voices and their reality is different than regular reality. It's just, it's, it's, so I lived through watching my parents divorce. And then um, I was in a foster home for a couple of years. And then um, when I was in the foster home, I had, some sexual uh, molestation happened to me, sexual abuse. And uh, I repressed it for five years. And you asked about the trigger. Well, for at that moment, when I was about 16, um, I had a, my appendix burst and abscessed, so I almost died. So when your body is going through a thing, it's not uncommon like for that kind of trauma for, for your body and your mind to remember things that you had locked away. Um, so that, so I was diagnosed then with a relatively new diagnosis, which was childhood PTSD, because they, they noticed that stuff had happened before that had triggered things. So, so I had the PTSD back then, the childhood PTSD. And so it seems to sort of continued along in my life where there's you know a trauma and then a thing 
Now, the first manic episode happened after my eldest had weaned herself, which doesn't sound like a manager trauma, but when your body is used to a certain amount of hormones or what have you, it decided it was a trauma. And I forgot how to sleep for a week. And um, I literally forgot how. Like I was laying in bed and I was trying to write down all my thoughts, you know, because maybe it was, you know, something I was forgetting to think or, you know, something I should write down. And so I did that whole notebook by the side of the bed thing. That doesn't help if you're manic because everything's important. I know. Oh, no. Oh, you, fro yeah. you froze for a moment. Actually, you just said something very interesting that just got my attention right away. Not only are you sharing that you were going through these mental health challenges, but at the same time, you're having the onset of a female a passage of ritual with like menopause and kind of things that your hormonal influence. Hormones, well, it actually, you think wow. about it, 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 you know, things happen, like the attacks happen, like things happened to me when I went first after I got, after I had puberty. And then the hormones changed in such a way after nursing that that was such a severe change to me that my body decided that that was a good time to freak out. Um, so you were saying about, uh, yeah, so now I'm going through a, you know, you know, I'm in, I'm somewhere in perimenopause. It's the like, they come with a better name. yeah, they should come with a better name for it, like the Gobi <laughs> Desert or something, because it's like, it's so long and you don't know you're out of it till you're out of it. Like there's right. no, there, a year afterwards, like, well, you know, should they, can they give me a heads up or something? You know, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, when you're entering that stage in life, I'm telling you, it comes at you, it hits you like a brick of tones, like a train without no brakes. Because I remember I was uh, very healthy, and I am a very healthy you are. Uh, female. And I had literally a non kind of signs. So my period came and went. Uh, it came to within the 21, 28 days. I never even kept track. I just oh. know, there you are, but he never gave me any problems. And my OBG, my doctor used to say to me, Well, no worry, your time, you're, you're gonna pay your dues, no worries. And I'm telling you, Anna, when I hit 50, around 50, that's when pretty much the menopause health broke loose. <laughs> so I got everything, but it was all compressed. So I'm very thankful that I was not your typical female that went through the menopause that changes. Uh, so technically, there's actually something that's there's something that a doctor coined uh, called premenopause, Peri which is Peri what, it's called perimenopause. Well, right? there's pre there's premenopause, which is like in your 30s. Then there's perimenopause, which happens around menopause, and then there's menopause. Right. So, so no, no, I totally relate. So I went through that. It lasted me until age 53, and now thanks God, I'm out of the water. I'm doing fine, but I will yeah. say that it was two and a half years of a train going without no breaks and not knowing where to stop <laughs> to what they just went. So thanks God for that. So that's very important that not only there's a lot of people that they need to know that sometimes, especially in the female world, that they're handling or um, enduring some kind of mental health challenge, then at the same time they're going to this stage, a passage of ritual in life for women that is menopause, and sometimes for men is middle middle life crisis. Mm -hmm. so we all go through some sense of imbalance in some point in our life. The the trick about this, or the important thing about this, is how we how we're going to overcome whatever is a challenge, and how we're going to come out of scattered with no scar and just continue. Or minimal scars, work. like yeah, you know, it, it's okay if we're scarred and broken in places because exactly. that actually makes us a little more interesting. There's a lot of in our house. We have a, a one of our ch children. One of my children has is on the autism spectrum, and so the autism world calls people that have no problems neurotypies and so because the ones that are neurodivergent which is autism or adhd or dyslexia or any kind of brain difference um we just know the struggle and neurotypies you have this feeling like they have no struggle they don't they can do things and think in order and sequence and make outlines for their papers and get you know easy A's and all that stuff. And uh, well, I'm sure they have their own struggles. Um, but my, AD, my ADHD and autistic and dyslexic friends are way more interesting. Way. They're the ones that are entrepreneurs. 
because they had to learn how to fail. They had to be comfortable with failure. Um, they're the ones that become entrepreneurs and become big business people. You know, Richard Branson, he's a dyslexic. Um, uh, the Fonz, he's dyslexic. Uh, ADHDers, I don't know any famous ADHDers. Oh, uh, Rick, Rick Green from the Red Green Show, he's yeah. ADHD, he's in Canada. So they call it ADD up there. So. <laughs> Just but to keep us all on our toes. No, no, you but know. isn't that amazing that sometimes the way society is structured, we're supposed to be feeding like a set of standards square, and not everybody square about is, round peg, square box. is cookie cutter to fit in that shape. And sometimes people get labeled because they might act different, they might process the stimuli that they're getting out of life different. That doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. We're not like one size fits all. But it's Absolutely. so fascinating that a lot of people that went, a lot of young people, when they enter the school district system, and they see this some kind of behavior that perhaps could be you no know, according to the norm. It could be a little bit more extrovert, uh, processing too much information fast, uh, quick learner or slow learning. And from that moment that you hit the school district, you become labeling and how people that are suffering or are having challenges with this dyslexia, like you just mentioned. But at the same time, it shouldn't be seen as a form of, of an impediment because I know a lot of people that have challenge in terms of supposedly being dyslexic or having a different way in how they process the stimuli that the neurocentral system is processing their brain. But that doesn't mean there, there, there's something uh, wrong with them. If anything, they have a different kind of brilliance. Right. And but for like, schools, like, they, they, have, they, they have to start recognizing that dyslexia is a thing. And that's starting to happen. Uh, the, lady from, uh, the lady from the Yale Dyslexia Center has actually spoken in Congress at least three times, three different years in a row. So they're trying to have a movement, and it happens... Uh, once, you know, it happens like for, they have a, a month, uh, I want to say it's October, it might be September, but it, the hashtag for that is hashtag uh, say dyslexia, capital S, capital D, because a lot of schools will skirt around dealing with dyslexics by, or they, they try, they want, okay, teachers go to become teachers because they want to help kids, but sometimes admin doesn't want to shell out the money that it takes to address dyslexia at the way that they learn. They try to make them learn by lecture. They try to make them learn by two-dimensional uh, art and teaching supplies and everything when they're three-dimensional thinkers. There are visual thinkers. Um, and so the hashtag say dyslexia is to bring awareness of the fact that if you don't say it, they can't address it. If you don't say it, they don't know it exists. Or they know it exists and they're trying to avoid it because uh, Gordon Illiam is there's there's a there's a way of, of handling reading Orton Gillingham uh, where it, it uh, it's it's not whole word and there's still that raging debate between whole word versus phonics and we got to get past that battle and we got to break down silos so that the academia will speak with the people who know about psychology and so forth. And so that there's a learning uh, that can happen for those people who have difficulties. My youngest is fortunate in that he's on the autism spectrum. So that automatically got him an IEP. But his is my middle child. He couldn't read till he was 12. Oh, wow. That's a problem. So uh, they, that, was the, that was the struggle I had with my middle child when he was in middle and high school. Uh, at some point he became a shutdown learner where he shut down and was resistant to authority because nobody was helping him anyways. So, um, so if we don't say dyslexia, if we don't raise a bit of a stink, now if you follow on, on Facebook, on, uh, on Twitter, um, there's uh, Facebook and Twitter both have lots of groups there's actually a group for each state that will follow that's following the struggle in dyslexia uh, and as far as the legal counsel and what each school each school district is going to do. Um, yeah, Desiree, it's, it starts uh, mid 30s. It can start, you know, just that's just when hormones start shifting a little bit. Um, 
yeah, so and on the other hand, um, yes, it's a learning disability. It's a learning dis it's a technically a learning disability. It's also a learning difference. And yes, we need to honor different ways that people learn. Because um, some people are hands on. Back years ago, when I was a kid, they had something called shop. There was shop class. There was people who built stuff with their hands. And there's still people everywhere that there's millions of jobs that are available that people don't have skills for. Because we've, as a society, decided that college is the route to success. When people who actually are visual thinkers, my grandfather would put the wiring on the inside of Navy boats in Brooklyn uh, during, uh, let's say, World War II. And so as a visual thinker, you can just look at a boat and go, okay, this all has to get done this way, this route. And they think 3D. Like 3D is where you take your Rubik's Cube and you turn it all the way around, maybe on an axis. And they think like that. Those are artists. Those are, you know, the out-of-box thinkers because they never were in the box to begin with. So I'm all over the place here. Uh, so, um, yeah. So we, so we have to be aware that there's the dyslexics. There's the ADHDers. There's OCDers. There's all these different people who have different ways of looking at things, and they're all valid, but they might need some help. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, you have people who are gifted. And all throughout the country, there's different standards for what their, each state will do or not do for their gifted community. Most of the time, it's nothing. And so you have all these brilliant people who are trapped in a classroom, and they've already thought through the lesson plan three months ahead because that's how they think. And they are left behind. I was one of those that was hiding in plain sight. I was gifted and ADHD. So every now and then I'd have these little moments of brilliance that would kind of blow my teachers out of the water. You could see the teacher go, oh, there's a live one. You know, like, oh, there's something going on. You know, and, and that's when I was seen because I was doing something remarkable. But I was there with all the other kids all the time and bored out of my skull because I was never recognized as gifted back then. My therapist recognized it. I did some testing with the therapist and the psychiatrist, which is how I got the label of ADHD. But the giftedness, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm what they classify in schools as 2E. And a lot of us are out there and a lot of us are hiding in plain sight. And we actually, it, being gifted is almost like being learning disabled. It sounds weird because people are, are hung up on the elitism and all kinds of stuff, but there's gifted in every socioeconomic class and culture and all over the world. And we're still going to be there. Um, <laughs> all right, Vicki. Um, yeah. Um, there's so much that you could read about, um, and there's good people out there doing good work, but it, you need some out-of-the-box thinkers to bring a lot of that stuff together. And I'm hoping that that more of us show up, you know. Anna, uh, I was just fascinated listening to uh, to your story and your experience because you're sharing a lot of aspects, even as a young child. And I heard kind of like in between the lines how early on when you were struggling with all these challenges, right? Mm -hmm. The diagnosis, how perhaps at the time the professionals were just going like what well, we study when I was going to school for biology and learning about scientific method. It's like trial and error. That's how they're going through the process of diagnosis. Like try this out, no? It's eliminating trial and error. Yeah, that's not it. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be that hard because there's people who've Stop. already... Lita Hollingsworth was doing research on gifted people in 1901. Isn't that like so we're not, you know, that's a hundred years, 120 years of research that's already been done. It's not, we're not reinventing the wheel here, folks. We shouldn't be reinventing the wheel because if, if the more time it takes for academia to figure it out, that's generation upon generation of kids that they're losing. That's generation upon generation. Do you know what kind of like dropout rate we have in the country? Side, you know, end to end, it's like 50%. Um, thank you, Carlos. Um, 
Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> he, he has very good conversation. We have a lot of really blab and and the live streaming communities. There's there's, I want to say o slightly overlapping concentric circles of live streamers. A lot of people are aware of different people in the community, but not everybody knows everybody. Um, at least not like, oh yeah, she was gifted. Oh, that's my love, Vicky. Yeah. So a lot of my friends are gifted. And I actually have asked them point blank. Well, I'll, I'll DM them quietly. I'm like, yo, were you, did they, you know, lately, did, did you get a gifted diagnosis? You know, and then they're like, oh, yes. How'd you know? Uh, because you're amazing. <laughs> that's how we know. We, we, you know what, giftedness, and, and Linda Silverman uh, writes extensively on it, and she has worked with the gifted community for 40 years. Uh, right now, she's based in Colorado. She's actually from the Rochester, Buffalo area. Yeah. Um, and she was the one, she was the person who coined the term visual spatial learner. So we have really amazing people who are doing good work and 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 it just takes a, some time for their the knowledge to get out there. Um yes, yes. Oh Vicky, I bet you could. Um we're the one gifted ones are are the ones that well like my middle child is the one I joke that that makes jokes and breaks stuff <laughs> because he likes to take things apart to see how they work. And he has got a fast mind, so he makes jokes. But he couldn't read till he was twelve, so he thought he was stupid. You see how that so how I, a kid who how a kid would shut down like that? He's also yeah. the child that's dealing with the, the anxiety, and 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 that's his mental struggle right now is is getting past anxiety. Anxiety is when your body's afraid, and there's no real reason why it ought to be. Like there isn't a tiger in the room. They're not on fire. There isn't an earthquake at that moment, yet your body is scared. And people can say, calm right. down all you want, but it doesn't do any good unless you can get your body into a place where you're not afraid. And that, for me, is what anti-anxiety medicines do. It takes away some of the fear so that I can actually be in my own head and trust my own intuition and do stuff like this. Wow. You know, you just kind of like share something very important because I was about to ask you this. When your son was young and they were going, I guess, through a way to diagnose what could be, uh, what type of mental health challenge could it be? Or could it be a personality disorder? Because you can have uh, mental yeah. challenge or personality disorder, one or the other or both. He didn't uh, have a, he didn't have a, an extensive diagnosis in that vein because even though uh, he and my son were both tested uh, within a month of each other um, my the the diagnostician who was a, a PhD who was friendly with the school district and res was respected by the school district which is a good key thing you want them to take the, the report seriously um, at that time my middle child was already shutting down he was there's a, a book out there that I don't know if I own, but I think I might have it on my wish list on Amazon called The Shutdown Learner. And the thought behind The Shutdown Learner is they get to a place of maximum frustration where they just shut down. They don't necessarily obey authority. They don't want to do the work. They don't see the point. They're the one gifted kids and kids with that kind of thinking structure need to see the big picture before they'll buy in. Um, and they weren't giving him enough information. They were just pushing him to the sidelines further and further. And so the diagnostician pegged that it was ADHD that was going on with my middle child, but he couldn't get any further than that because my son barely cooperated with the testing as is. Now the other child had three things going on at the same time that he could tease out. The diagnostician said there was ADHD. There's a learning, there's a, um there's autism high functioning autism adhd and he pegged that there was some kind of a learning uh a hidden learning disability but he couldn't tease out what that was i through a lot of my research which anybody who knows me knows that i like research i could just show you a picture of my net nightstand it's like a jenga stack it's crazy but what my youngest 
seems to have and that travels in families is dyslexia. It, it's something in the family of dyslexia. I can't necessarily say it is dyslexia because I haven't got diagnosed because that takes more time and money. And, and right now everything, you know, for weeks and months, everything was shut down for COVID. Anyhow, so there's that. Um, but before that, you know, we just couldn't go and get diagnosed because there's not that many people who do that around here. Because, like I said, the schools barely recognize that dyslexia exists. So why are they going to test for something if they're not going to do anything about it? So that's a frustration. So the middle child got kind of shuffled along. And the youngest, I actually made a stink a couple of years ago um, at, at school. And I didn't, I don't want to say made a stink. I had a, a CSE meeting, which for those who are not familiar with all the alphabet soup in education, CSE is for Council of Special Education. And so I spoke to the head of the, the chairperson of the, the CSE and I said, look at my youngest is 16. He cannot read. He cannot graduate high school and not be able to read. That is unacceptable. We have to do something. Anna, I'd like to have him pause. tested for dyslexia. So he Anna, actually tested him. Let me pause you for it because you said something. I like what, what you just mentioned. What was the name of the services that the school provided when they were addressing the needs for your child? Something about CSE? CSE, Council of Special Education. Oh. It's, it's going to be, it might be a different name in your state, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, Every state seems to approach things differently, so it might have a different name for, but that's what it's called in our local school district in New York State is the Council of Special Education. And they're the ones that are sort of responsible for getting the FAPE, the fair and practical, fair and something uh, education. It, it's, it's, it says that it, the laws basically say that they have to provide some kind of education that is going to be equitable to what everybody else is getting, um, even if it has to be tailored to their specific needs. Um, he is on a certification track, which is a hard decision that we had to make years ago, where he's not going to be getting a standard dis a diploma like everybody else does. Yes. Graduation day, he gets a certificate. So that states that he was where he was supposed to be for all those years, but he's going to have a different skill set than his peers because yes. he couldn't do the work at that age. And even now it's a struggle. He still, he puts in the energy, he puts in the work, but if you can't, if you have a trouble processing words going in or you have problems with words going out, you're not going to show up good on testing and paper or in, you know, the testing, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's just hard all around. Uh, for now, people let, me ask, let me ask you something. How old is he? How, and what, how old the youngest is 16. 16. So he's seeing what? 10th grade? He's, uh, actually this year he's going to be a junior. Oh, wow. Good for him. Congratulations. Yeah. Getting closer to the finish line. Right, because it's the last one. <laughs> and because <laughs> my my oldest is twenty five, so I've actually been in the school system for twenty years now. Yeah. <sighs> now, let me ask you something because listening to everything you're sharing, and I was hoping that we will get into that in interception in where perhaps I will hear that your experience in managing all these mental challenges that to me they're transitory. Um, have the, anyone doing that professional? that work with you have ever offered to you any kind of other alternative uh, treatment, like for example, to consider a meditation, yoga, some kind of mindfulness uh, treatment that will help uh, you and the people in your family that are having uh, the challenges to deal with how they process the stimuli they receive from life, which is all the thought making ability that we have. Um, so I want to have a couple of answers that. Okay. I have a couple answers to that. One, um, my my youngest uh, has gotten, uh, they do approach something about meditation in school, and he likes to be able to quiet himself by meditating. Uh, uh, his stem is almost a kind of a meditation. It's it's how he stems is he has this uh, three straws squished into one, and he waves it around and, I don't know, maybe pretends he's in space or something. but. That's his stem. Um, but for meditation, he says he, he likes the thought of it. So it, he must be being taught it in the classroom for him to actually verbalize it. Mm -hmm. I didn't encounter meditation until I was in college. Oh, wow. 
And then th you were saying you, there was a word that you came up with that uh, that you said uh, about um, sensory things. He's my only. He's my youngest, and he's the one that got labeled in school with SPD, which is sensory processing disorder. Wow. Which qualified him to actually be able to, you know, the school pegged it as SPD. Uh, the, the psychologist didn't mention it. It's part of the autism world. Um, but because he had uh, an IEP, he had access, and even before, yeah, he's had an IEP forever, but he had access to these rooms that are called occupational therapy. Yes. And these are brilliant. If your school district has one or a bunch of them, uh, advocate for that for yes. all your all your schools because what that what they do in there the work that they do in there is they get the person's body out of the way so that their mind can work properly. Right. Um, they learn how to learn. There's these bubbles that have lights and they're different colored towers of bubbles and there's uh, swings that are supportive. There's weighted vests. There's weighted blankets. There's fidget toys. There's all this stuff. The, all these tools that are created especially and housed in these rooms called occupational therapy rooms. So if you have an occupational therapist on in your district, you know, lavish them with gift cards and stuff so they could do what they do because um, this stuff isn't cheap and they have to special order it for the schools. Uh, some of the stuff, the fidget stuff is, is readily available on Amazon. Some of the higher tech stuff has to be special ordered through Amazon and okayed by various groups. But they're they're mass they're they're just magical rooms. You walk into them, and I'd never seen a room that was so satisfying in my life. And I and I think our whole because we're we our whole family know our little nuclear family just all acknowledges that we're not neurotypical. So we kind of bask in some of that by allowing ourselves little fidget toys like I have this thing over here. I get in a really super stressful uh, live stream or something, I have this one thing that my best friend and I found, and it squishes. So anything that's tactile, <laughs> colorful, um, bright, um, cheerful, interactive. I, I don't have any fidgets. What? I don't have any fidgets. I, I had to look because I, I, I used to have them up there. I have like all this. Oh, yeah, I do have something. that like Even something simple like this, which looks dumb, but this is called Cloud Putty uh, from the makers of Silly Putty. You get I love a, a the stuff student that you got in the back of your wall. All that. Yeah, this is all just fun that. stuff. I just love for, this stuff. Uh, just for together. visuals. Yeah, um, this is the, the London Tower that's supporting this because I had a, a name thing in front of it, but I'm no longer a, a, a girl boss. Well, I kind of am because I have my own company that I'm trying to build, but I was also part of a, a startup. And so I took the girl boss thing down. But anyway, so I got some flowers. I got Bob Ross. I got Squirrel because ADHD. I, thank you, Vicki. Um, I have the MTV Award because I remember when MTV was it. a new thing. A Funko. And then up here, I can go up one. This is a DVD that I have signed by my favorite percussion, world percussionist, Louis Conte. Nice. Um, and I have photographs, and this is the guy, Inigo Montoya. Uh, oh, yes, I know right? that. <laughs> and then I have other, like, you know, all these can, like, some of these, like, up here, like, years ago, we didn't know we had fidget toys. But guess what? We did. This here, anything that moves, and if you could do it quietly, if you can do it in such a way that it doesn't, that doesn't distract other learners, like, like pen clicking is satisfying to us, but it drives other people with auditory things berserk because they cannot handle that noise. This is a, 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 the cloud putty. You can do this and it distracts you from, from, you know, say if you're in a stressful test or something. And I've had, uh, I've actually gotten cappuccino for my, my students before they have a, a test so that they can actually uh, focus and do the work because sometimes you just have to do a test and when you're homeschooling there's these standardized tests you have to do at the end of the year so they can see how much they're learning so i would get them ca caffeine because i knew then before they were even diagnosed that it might do the trick yeah thank you vicky um and, and thank you Stephen. and so there's there's so much that i could cover um but yeah so like we should appreciate when people are different 
we need to appreciate when people have mental challenges and problems and and when things get hard um because right now i think now more than ever i think we're aware that everybody is struggling um to some extent some people might bask in their wine groups but that's how they socialize or that's how they're coping you know um some people like i'm in a group that gifts wines to other people other moms because moms could use the support right now because a lot of moms do a lot of everything um but right now everyone's going through something and i think we just kind of have to make room for that and i hope maybe this is actually something that'll remain after covid is the realization that everyone's going through something you can look all pulled together all you want but and even if nobody sees you except god um they you know god you know you you know if you are crying in the middle of the night or in your bathroom to so that you don't alarm the, re the rest of your family you know there's things we all have to do sometimes just to get through um and right now you know with my son and i both take anti-anxiety meds okay fine you know if that's all it is god that's not bad you know Stop aiming for perfect. Fuck perfect. Sorry, this is now an NSF. That's okay. Show. <laughs> uh, I, I, Anna, I can assure you that whoever is listening to those broadcasts, they can have better words more so than we do. So yeah. that's, I don't so, see that. Yeah, we, don't can't, we can't strive for perfect because right now we're just trying, a lot of us are just striving to be normal enough not to be pegged for as weird as we really are. Because we don't always want to show how, everyone how weird we are because weird isn't always welcome. Exactly. Now, our community, the live streamers, we're all a little weird. We get it. A lot of us are gearheads and love all the tech. And, and you know, I love that because I can watch other people get excited about something that I've never heard about or I didn't know about. <laughs> and that's the beauty of it, Anna, that the divine creator has such a great sense of humor and good taste that he actually showcases diversity in the world, in the planet, through all the living species. It's impossible that we're going to be the same because we're already the same in one aspect, and it is that we have the same one spirit. So it makes only sense that because we come from the same one spirit, one essence, that we got to have diversity with that spirit, but we're the same in terms of uh, what we have inside. And let me take this quick interjection. Because one of the things that I find fascinating after listening to everything you share, uh, it appears that in that professional community of the uh, kind of like the established medical health field, just now, perhaps in this last five years, they're just starting to open their mind to consider other approach to treating mental health other than just popping pill on people. There's oh, such yeah. as meditation. Because what is mental health? Really quick, so you can continue, Anna which is important uh, for us to share. Mental health, basically, is the challenge that anyone or we are facing when our mind is totally out of control because we're processing all the stimulation that we're receiving uh, from the outside, like your life story, your life experience, every moment, every scenario, and our mind, which is our engine that makes us work, right? It's constantly processing information. So if we're not careful or mindful or being a guardian to our thoughts, you can see that we're going to all, always producing thoughts that perhaps are not positive. So we're constantly sabotaging our quality of life because of the thoughts that we're creating. So many people, unbeknown to you, it's like a car that you're driving. Think of it this way. To me, mental health is this, a car that you're driving. You're driving a Maserati, but you haven't taken a course. You just know how to put the foot in the pedal, hold on to the steering wheel, and just hit the pedal, and you just going and sometimes not having control of the speed or what to do next. So to me, that's how sometimes the brain, our brain process, all the stimuli that we're having on the outside from all life experience, relationship, work, friends, whatever it is, anything that creates emotion. So if we're not careful with our thoughts, it could really cause a havoc, a mayhem in our life. And I'm surprised that in so many years of so much advances, 
in, in studies that they have done, the entities of the powers that may be, this all great academia, let's say Harvard, Johns Hopkins, all this institute, the National Institute of Health, that they spend so much money in conducting research in the disciplines that address mental health challenges. And just barely now recently, they're doing the bridge and the connection of mindfulness, spirituality, and mental health. And how mindfulness could be so uh, helpful to people when they learn basically to control the thoughts that you're creating in your mind. So yeah, the, the, I think they're starting to come around to it because um, when I was going through my 18 years of therapy, I was actually doing the gold standard approach at the time, which was standard approach. Uh, we're, working, it, was a, it was called the three prong approach. It was a psychiatrist, therapy, and medication. Now, the therapy at the time that I was exposed to was called talk therapy. But what is, what is available now and what my best friend is actually going through right now is something called DBT, um, dialectical behavior therapy or something. Basically, it, it teaches you stuff that you can do. They give you actual, like, um, they give you uh, things you can do to stop your brain from just ruminating on, and going in, on that little hamster wheel um uh, there's something you can do to interrupt your thought that you put like ice cubes under here and mindfulness is actually embraced it seems to be in this one uh therapy that my my uh, friend is doing so i think there's hope i think like i said it takes a while for it to trickle down from academia you know from the people doing the research to the academics from the ap academics to the schools where people are trained as teachers to the practicum you know and it takes some time um and uh i was i was told once that um that actually a friend of mine was told that, that they were a ferrari with bike brakes <laughs> so good. that their brain was a ferrari so they had to treat themselves well because if they had to go to the shop it was expensive to fix you know <laughs> you know so but with bike brakes so i told that one to my son he laughed out loud he's like exactly right and also something about the gifted community that is is uh been long well known is something called over excitabilities now how over excitabilities overlaps and where one ends between gifted and adhd uh even the community itself doesn't know linda silverman had somebody on but the over excitabilities is is where you see a sunset like the gifted the gifted life is a gift, different experience. Like this is a neurotypical that are fine and, and they have their life and okay, cool. We see the color, like clearly I enjoy the color red, right? So it's here. I like, you know, sparkly, shiny things. I have sparkly, shiny rings. You know, it because when I experience color, it's a whole, it's damn near a whole body experience. When I see a sunset, it's like whoosh. Um, and and it's like, wow, like, thank you, God, that I have codes and rods, rods in my eyes where I can actually see and appreciate color. Because we didn't have to do that. You know, like dogs and so forth, they only see in black and white. Wow, bummer, you know, because, like, you look at the color green. There's, like, thousands of shades of green, you know. So, but the overexcitability is, is such that, that we respond to those things that really uh the kids would say give us life you know like <laughs> and so um so basically in a way what you pretty much have shared just barely now in the professional community that my handles you know helping people with mental health challenges have they ever bring that a, approach would you consider meditation will the health insurance even pay for some medication it, I, classes or yoga, something that is designed to help. And I think it's going to be started. I think it is. Mind. I think it is being uh, uh, except my my uh, friend has really good insurance and they're covering DBT and the stuff she's learning about. Uh, she has to take a log every day of what she's experiencing and why and what happened, and so she actually has to face everything that she's thinking of every day and eventually she's seeing a, the the therapist can look at her the psychiatrist can look at and see a pattern yeah and and how that what that does to her 
yeah, she's that's still really learning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It seems like what this 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 person, this uh, psychiatrist, the way he's working with this person, is a way of creating awareness, basically by making the person sit down, whatever, or write whatever is thinking in their mind. It is a way to bring attention to that present moment. And she hates it. She hates writing down stuff every day because <laughs> some days are just. She's not feeling anything because she's also on lithium. And what lithium does is yeah, it brings exactly. your highs down and your lows up. So you're kind of, and there's other medicines that actually physically make you feel numb. Yeah. Like, I mean, maybe you could touch things, but it just nothing, of nothing gets in. And that's yeah. part of when you're depressed. That's also a similar feeling too, because you, nothing juices you, you know, hey, Karen, um, <laughs> Uh, she's, he's he's actually coming uh, watching us from uh, England. So oh, wow. and he's a, he's another, he's another welcome, of our lives. Welcome. Yeah. welcome for joining us this morning, Anna. This is so fascinating because uh, the more advanced we're getting in time, talking with 2020, this year has been test uh, testing enough for anyone that's having all kinds of any challenges, emotional, romantic, whatever it is. People that are struggling with the life story. And if coronavirus has done something, is to basic forces us to go in, even if literally, physically, you have to kind of be more mindful of, aware of your surrounding. And there has never been a better time to actually, for our medical profession, to recommend mindfulness. Because there's one thing that is going to help all of us to survive this pandemic is basically learning how to we can live with ourselves, meaning our mind, tame it down, control it, find the ways in where you can silence the chatter in your mind because that's what creates our life story, is what causes us stress, anxiety, fear. Because something you said earlier, when you said that when your son is having a, an experience, some kind of anxiety, and you did a really good example, and he's fine. There's nothing causing it, but nevertheless, he feels this in his body. That's in a way is called, I read this in Edgar Tolle book, The New Earth, that he actually talks about the pain of the body. Because basically, this is a vessel. It's a container. It's like an alchemist. So everything you're putting in the vessel is your body, is your thought, your mind. So when you say he's having a fear, an anxiety, it will be great if the approach to uh, considering meditation can sort of help anyone that is having this struggle to pay attention to the thoughts and get back to your breathing. Just sit there, watch your thoughts, watch the story that you're telling you, that you're creating in your mind. Because someone else, you might be hearing something, but ultimately we are the ones that are processing the information that we're receiving from the outside in our life, you know, and that we have the ability to discern, do I want that kind of thinking in my mind? Should I reject it? Should I just sum on my present, which is to be present here now, taking it back to your breath? And that's why meditation is such a resourceful and helpful um, skill to learn. And it's free. All we have to do is just basically sit there, it, Try to breathe in, breathe out, observe your mind. No worry about your mind. Just detach yourself from the experience and just surrender, accept whatever it is as it is in this present moment, taking a deep breath, inhaling, inhaling. I know there's a, a skill there's set to this, but we, exactly. And, and you can share that. There's so many ways that expert teaches people how to be able to command attention to your present moment by breathing exercise, which is nothing other than try to meditate calmly, be accepting of this moment, regardless of it is. I'm going to say, if your life right now is in a shit hole, so what? It is in a shit hole. Accept and, it. It's and okay. Don't Make it better with the shit. That's all there and, is to it. And don't guilt yourself like hardcore if you have monkey brain. Because exactly. a lot of us do. And because we have a lot of thoughts going on all the time. That's kind of how gifted this works. <laughs> We're curious <laughs> all the time. It's not like, I wish I had a switch to turn it off sometimes. It would be nice. But there's also there's this there's this constant curiosity about everything and wanting to gather knowledge about things and to go deep, not like small talk. We want to like go deep. But when you're doing the whole mindfulness exercise, the meditation, I remember in Eat, Pray, Love, she was complaining about having monkey brain. And I totally get that because like 
like I'm like, oh, if I can't quite do it like everybody else is like, maybe there's something wrong with me, you know? And then there's that whole heavy thing and then you have this self guilt. You're like, no, no, no. You have to kind of make, you know, say thank you, you know, brain for keeping me safe and then push all of the thoughts away. And then you're supposed to get back to it. It's the getting back to it. That's the ADHD problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, and and you're totally right. That monkey brain is the actual, is actual enemy. This monkey brain is actually is the enemy because somehow we need to figure that out how to tame the monkey in our brain. And the only way we can do that, honestly, um, and I don't mean to sound like I'm Jesus, she goes again with meditation and mindfulness, but that's the no, only thing to it do works. it. But it's the only thing that it says, you know, the spirit is in you, it's not outside of us, it's the energy within you. And that spirit has a life, has an essence, has an presence. So what is stirring that spirit within you to experience this life? Well, your mind. So if your mind is full with negative thoughts, right? And complaining and going through life dissatisfaction and you run into your mind, everything in life is not going according to the way your heart desire, that is going to cause frustration, it's going to cause anxiety, it's going to cause sadness or feelings of inadequacy, whatever. The thing is that most people, when they're experiencing some kind of mental health challenge related to depression, uh, anxiety, it has to do with a desire, with a longing that we have in our heart that somehow we haven't been able to obtain whatever that could be. And it applies to everything in life, physical, emotionally, and spiritual that we always have that longing. So if we don't know how to identify what is that longing that is causing us some kind of distress in our life, that's where mayhem and uh, havoc is going to come. That's why it's so important to uh, bring attention to your present moment. See your life as a movie. Detach yourself from the experience. Take a look at the movie. See, wow, that's what's going on in the movie. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow, I am the director. I'm the producer. And the protagonist, you the thing is, it's not I'm not going to the Oscar <laughs> in this movie world. You can buy yourself your, your own mind award. buy your own awards. <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. Because <laughs> we're doing it all. Everyone is a one man, one woman show in their mind, and they're processing the life exactly how they are opening up to it to receive it. And not everything and everyone, or excuse me, or everything in life is going to go according to how we want it. But nevertheless, we have the power and the gift of discernment to say, that's not me. I am present. I am here. I am the divine processing this moment, moment, accepting it as it is. And we just let it go. Let it be. And make every moment that you're finding yourself constantly present great. So when you move to the next second of that moment of your life, you're going to bring that greatness with you. That's why to be mindful is so important because you're processing the present moment right now, here, free of bias, free of suffering, free of pain, and you just accept it as it is with equanimity. So how do we do that? It sounds so easy to do, right, Anna? But all we have to do is just take the moment and before we finish the chat in a little while, we're gonna have we're gonna do a quick meditation exercise, maybe it's one minute. So I can show people how easily this is because a lot of people do have difficulty in um, wanting to learn to meditate. And they basically say, every time I sit quietly trying to meditate, my monkey brain gets active. And he's telling me about all the things that I, excuse the French, F top, or the things that I haven't done, the things that I need to do that I'm not doing, or things that I want to do and I'm afraid to do. That's what my brain is kicking in. I'm dealing with an argument that I have with my spouse or my significant other or my friend, my partner, my colleague, my neighbor. Something is going on that I want and it's just not happening the way I wanted it. So all that is going to cause distress, dissatisfaction, and this longing for whatever. That's one way you need to take a look inside yourself. What is causing that anxiety? It is totally related, directly related to something that we desire from the heart and we're not getting it, you know, and that's what causes anxiety, the fear, the frustration, and the body reacts to it. The body oh, responds yeah. to I, that body pain. I, I was depressed for four years and I can, I know what the, the trigger for that was, was 
having my mom in my house for four months. <laughs> you know, um, and nothing, you know, no shade on anybody who actually can do it, but my mom is a certain kind of person who um, she has her own struggles and and her own way of, of expressing love or or dissatisfaction or what have you. And at some point after we had gave we gave her a chance to either go to our local hospital or to go home. So she chose to go home. And then after that, I was depressed for four years oh. because I had to come to a place where I had to accept that the stereotypical soft, warm, fuzzy mom that a lot of other people experience was not going to be my experience, was never really going to be my experience. And that was a, that you just had to come to terms with it and sit with it. And, and you can't even shake yourself out of your own depression. People try, they're like, oh, just cheer up. It's not that. It's like when your body's done being depressed, you're done. It lifts. It goes. And and I think part of that process was just coming to terms with. I know my mom loves me the way she can. I know that everyone's trying. Everyone was trying their best when I was a kid, and now as my kids are coming up, I tried my best when they were little. You know, I've even offered help with therapy for that. <laughs> but um, so. It, it, don't beat yourself up about it if you're going through a hard time because even though you might get it in your brain it, until the rest of it gets it it's going to take as long as it takes <laughs> Anna that's so fascinating because and look at you you're sharing your story and there are all the struggles and the challenges that you have and to me when I first met you and I met you online I haven't even met Anna in life person. I met it through our mutual friend, Carlo Phoenix, in one of his main uh, live streaming events as the master of streamer that he is. <laughs> well, uh, you met, well, you met him because he was producing a thing with Oh, Rick. that's right. Oh, you see, I forgot. Then I follow him up to his show. That's and I right. remember people's stories. That's uh, kind of isn't that funny. Thank you. <laughs> you see how brilliant you are? I even, I'm having my senior moment over here. I rebuke oh. that. It's not a senior moment. People <laughs> say that and they make themselves feel old and it's oh, not. No. It's, oh, you really have a lot going on. You have, you have a, you're producing the show. Oh my you're God. stopping <laughs> deep in your brain to figure out how to say things uh, away in English, which is your second language. <laughs> Give yourself some credit. <laughs> Don't forget about me. I'm making this about you. So what I'm saying is that when I met Anna, I was so drawn to her energy because she's such a kind soul. And I have to say that as an empath as I am, maybe because of this medium, I never perceived of Anna that she was having some kind of mental health uh, struggles challenges until she actually shared with me this last past few days and i was like get out of town my goodness so the reason i'm sharing this is because there goes to show you someone that's basically has become an expert in mental health challenges with different aspects of mental health and there she is thriving and living a fulfilling life she says expert and coming curator for streaming life and is it's possible. So what I'm saying is, if there's anyone out there struggling with any kind of life dissatisfaction, pain, suffering, suffering, because it's coming from a place of the heart that you're not able to uh, fulfill something of your heart desire, work guarding your thoughts. Switch the chip. Let's say, for example, I'm going to use that as an example, perhaps, that she's having challenge with her son right now that's also having a few struggle. I would try to, obviously, to put it in a content. Uh, my son is going through this challenge right now at this moment, but I know, I know for a fact, I feel for a fact that he's going to overcome it. And how you convey and transmit and transmute that thinking also to your son but it's like these two short paths, let's focus in this present moment. Perhaps you don't have, or you're able to get what you want from your heart right now, but let's be grateful. As hard as this sounds, be grateful for this moment. We're breathing, we're alive. Things are not going the way we want it, but we're here nevertheless. And for that, we're thankful. And when you start doing that, you see how your heart start opening up 
and it starts calming down. That's why it's so important to bring attention to your breath and see the movie in your mind. And you can able and you will be able to tell, wow, that's a terrible movie. I don't know. It's like when going to Netflix. That's how I see my mind. <laughs> I look at my mind, I go into Netflix. I'm looking for something to watch. And then I see the previews kind of thing. I read what is it about. I don't like that movie at all. So I do the same with me. When I'm having raging thoughts that are causing me a little bit of distress, I meet in some of the spirit and say, I am. I am the light. I am the image of liking of the divine. Sounds crazy, but it works. Because I'm summoning my presence, the essence of me, the energy, the life force that is allowing me to be here right now with Anna, talking, breathing, sharing these things with you. So I believe I'm a strong advocate of mindfulness because I believe that mindfulness is the solution for everything because it brings you to that place of consciousness. And where you're conscious, you connect with everything around you, with everyone, and you're able to see that you're just merely an active observant of that life story and that you can actually change the movie in your mind just like you do with Netflix. So how do we go about that? And it's about finding a place quietly you can do this throughout the days. I do it when I'm walking. I even do it when I'm driving sometimes. With my eyes open, I just empty my mind and I try to be alert everything that the flowers, the tree, the, the beautiful blue sky, like I'm watching right now, that I, there's this gorgeous day behind this window that I can wait to get out there and enjoy. And mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't mean that my life is free of struggles, uh, free of challenges, free of issues. Oh, no, trust me. <laughs> I have a bag full of those, but I decide in my mind, when do I want to carry that bag? Because everything in life every day has a time, a sunny place. And not every day we can have our mind filled with all the negativity. We really have to make the effort to start to clean our canvas with being grateful, at least to say thank you. Even if you're having a terrible day, thank you for this terrible moment, but I am here. How can I serve? And I am telling you, when we get that attitude, that's when the universe starts arranging itself in a way that it's going to respond to all your heart desires because you are, you're creating it with your mind. Is that something that you have ever tried, Anna? Is that something that it appeals I to think, you that you would like to try? I think what I, what I, um, I remember hearing there was a Bible verse that talks about, um, you know, be careful of what you, let your mind rest on because what your mind soaks in is what becomes your thoughts and your actions and your words and all that. And, and I think there's something to that. So I try, I try to be really careful what I let into my um, space as far as media and so forth. Like I'm, I'm kind of picky about music and I'm kind of picky about like, visuals like sometimes i just need pretty visuals that take me someplace else um just something um, amazing um uh and i think the visual thing is something that not everybody is aware of because people will watch absolute garbage but and then they wonder why they feel lousy later not you know maybe they're going through a lousy time as is but that's you know but I, I tend to watch movies that are uh, like Indian movies or um, um, some foreign films, um, and more of the 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 well thought out um, the, the the movies that are designed to to have an emotion that goes with the the color palette that they choose. Um, and I find that I can be more restful if I can have colors that speak to me, um, that have that have that peaceful resonance, um, and and it, I was picky with what I would let my kids watch too because I know that they're visual people. My eldest is an artist and a poet, and so. Um, that one, if they saw a scary image, they'd have nightmares for weeks after. Wow. So, you know, that just shows how powerful our minds are that, and what, they, what you got to feed it. Yeah, and you just shared something very interesting when you mentioned um, your church. And I'm just curious, uh, in your church, 
or in a, and where you congregate, do they actually all have any kind of approach uh, for people that are having these kind of challenges with mental health? How they approach someone in their parish that might be approaching them and say, you know, I'm struggling with mental health. And other than to send you to some kind of psychiatrist or, or to take pills, what kind of approach is your uh, congregation uh, uh, provides you to help you in helping with dealing with these challenges, Hannah? I'm just curious, how is the, uh, I was, the I church was just, or religious approach to how they help with mental health with you? To, with you? I, I've been part of a couple churches. Um, one church uh, was very kind to us and they tried to pray through everything. And right. prayer I, is, is amazing. It's excellent, don't get me wrong. But if you're in the middle of, uh, what do they call it? Uh, not decompressing. Uh, when, when you're coming, when you're falling apart slowly, there's a, there's a psychiatric term for it. And so when I was dealing with not sleeping for a week straight, um, prayer is not really going to touch that. Um, it touches it a little bit. It's, it's nice to have people around you that want to pray and prayer chains and all that are great. But um, at some point I, it had to be addressed with medicine because nothing else was breaking through. Um, and that's when they threw the kitchen sick at me and that's the whole. Then the second church I've been going to, um, I think they are letting i think if you had a need you could tell people about you know they could pray and stuff but i i don't really know what this new church is about because i haven't really let them in on all this stuff that i've been dealing with yes um i have friends who don't know anything of what i deal with um i just kind of keep it to myself because not everybody needs to know um, exactly no, it's, I, I find that interesting, uh, like I said, because I always there's a correlation to me about people's ability to learn how to meditate and the uh, religious practices, believe, because sometimes they don't see it like one relates to the other or that one. It's like you're playing one. hooky on God if you want yeah, to go and, find out about this other and stuff. But. Exactly. And, that's, and it shouldn't be because reality, you know, I had a very... Um, to me, a very fortunate uh, childhood in the fact that before age 12, my parents were not practicing like Catholics. They would go to church once in a blue moon, uh, baptism of weddings, uh, maybe uh, Misa de Gloria, which is uh, Christmas Mass in the midnight or Christmas Eve. So I recall as a child going through those passages, you know, those rituals of religion, but it was not really like ingrained like nailed down to your hair like this way you gotta know they were very free form and almost to a way that it was very beneficial to me because i grew up around a neighborhood that we have all kinds of neighbors that have different religions so everybody was there pentecostal protestant Jehovah witnesses seven days same days whatever baptist everybody was in the neighborhood so we were all around the same age 10 5 9 12 years old so we were all growing together like chickens so because we were all in school, then come home after school, we play and then all over again for seven days. Sunday was only natural that that collective little club, uh, little brats, they always wanted to be together. And we were always saying, can I go to little Johnny's house for, for Sunday school? Because on Sunday school, not only was fun, we danced, we sing, we we did colorings of the stories of the Bible and they fed us candy and cake at the end. He was like, how could you not want to go to Bible school on Sunday? Right. So I had the opportunity to go to every Bible school in my neighborhood. And to me, I see it now in Happenstein looking back, it was a blessing because that gave me the foundation for me to understand and relate to different people, dependence of their religious belief and background. And yet there's one thing that we share in common and that is, that every religion out there that said that believes in Christianity, right? That we are creating the image and liking of a divine, of an omnipresent entity. And that makes us therefore little clones of that divinity. You know, I, I learned believing that we don't look for God outside because I recall in going to some Pentecostal church that they turned their cults are very like, when I said cults is the guru because it's Spanish, they call him culto but it doesn't mean related to the word cult. It means mostly like a gathering, like an assembly of people. 
So they will scream and yell and scare the living bejesus out of people to repent. The devil is going to come and get you. You're going to rot in hell. That sort of thing, right? So I was always terrified. But there's one thing that stuck with me in all the screaming and yelling from all these different religions was that the one thing. You are creating the image of like it of that divine. And I understood as a young child early on to say, oh, what that means that I'm Jesus. So Jesus is in me. I don't have to go look or seek Jesus anywhere. I learned this by age eight. So that's right. If I am creating an image and liking of that beautiful omnipresent and that divine entity that makes me a clone of that it, whatever it is, man or woman. So I really took that to heart and believe it. So when I believe that I'm creating the image and liking of the divine and that means that I have the ability to summon the spirit within me. So when you summon the spirit, because I am the spirit, I am the divine, nobody comes through me except through the father. The father already lives in me, the mother or the it, whatever it is. All I know is the beautiful, unconditional love that the humanity calls love. So if we get to that space in our head, excuse me, which is in our heart, I think we all can overcome a lot of the challenges that life is continuously throwing at us like fastball. We just got to learn how to summon the spirit. And I keep, people ask me all the time, Yvonne, how do you summon your spirit? And just say, just say, I am. I am. I am the spirit. I am in the image of liking of you. I summon you to be present here with me now. And that somehow helps to minimize the anxiety, the sadness, the depression, the hurt, the loneliness, the suffering. Because all of a sudden I realize I am the divine. And as crazy as it sounds, but it is true. We have the ability to be the divine. We are the spirit incarnated in the flesh. What is the challenge in our human condition, Anna? That we have been convinced to believe otherwise. That we have to go outside of us to go seek God. Mm. But that divinity, whatever is your religious belief, and in reality, we are the divinity. That's what we are supposed to be walking in grace every day. And we have to exercise the right speech, the right action, the right intention, the right thought, the right communicate. I mean, that's what the Ten Commandments is all about. Mm -hmm. So when we decide to make a commitment with ourselves, that we're going to embrace the divine in every single waking moment, as of like this moment, you're going to start feeling the release of your spirit on binding, getting itself out of the prison of the mind, because that's what I see the mind is. Our mind is our jail cell, it's our prison. So if we don't guard our thoughts and we see where thoughts are going, we so easily can fall in the abyss and deep, 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 because that's how powerful we are. And we every day show our power with our mind, what we think, what we imagine, we create. So I do believe that through mindfulness, mindfulness is to me is the cure for mental health. I mean, yes, I understand, of course, we have people that suffer a lot of mental health challenges that are chemistry body related, but the ones that are so easily because it's caused by personality disorders or the work of the mind, which are most of them, we have the ability to take control of our mind. Especially people that are brilliant, oof, they got the ticket because we have all that brilliantness. And all we're missing is having the ability to have that switch off and on that we have it inside ourselves and just muster that strength and say, all right, I have messed up thoughts this morning. Thank you for sharing. I'm not interested. I'm just, I am. I am accepting. I am surrendering to the divine and the divine and I, we're going to kick us right now. That's how you muster the spirit. Come in, solve your own. It is difficult, but it's doable. It is about controlling your mind, your thoughts. Try to switch. I know it's not easy, but if you're thinking negative, do a quick test. Think of something positive. Think the opposite of what you don't want. Because we manifest, we create the life that we have in our mind. So if we can. Um, or so even want to, sounds like you want to like focus on those things you do want. Exactly. As opposed, because if you're focusing on what you don't want, I remember hearing that your mind doesn't really hear the word no. Yeah. Yeah. 
or or the neg you know if you like do not think about that well your brain is going to think about that because it doesn't see no yes because it's that's exactly we have the ability to manifest everything we think and um i when i'm coaching clients this is one of my biggest challenges and i told them before you even get this and i'm trying to cut you to the chase so you don't spend so much money because this is not for me to make money it's to try to help you to live a life of significant to be here present now regardless of what's going on in your life you have the ability to be happy you know if we can just detach from all the desires of the heart whatever that that they be that's when we will experience freedom will experience joy and happiness even if we don't get what we want because when you surrender not getting it you eventually will get it that's just the way it is it's just so crazy or so, something better might come along exactly sometimes when we want something let's say for example a lot of the female friends that i have uh, counsels through the years and clients and uh, since i was 25 years old not having the ability to manifest the partner they were romantically and when they do it's not the right guy and i always and you just have to let things go and i say things as they are and just make a party let's like, say oh my god that's so cool okay it didn't work i'm all pooped up but i'm all excited about what's coming you because that's not the end of your story you didn't get what you wanted whatever was the romantic relationship you tried you were so hard you were making it work but hey he ran his course that's when you got to switch the ship and say all right i tried everything in my power i saw the sign this is not what the universe of the divine has for me or god um uh, i gotta get in excited mode because something new is coming even if you don't know what it is the, the fact that on something new is coming is enough to get anyone excited so what i'm trying to say is that we all live in a duality and that duality is that we are the spirit and that we are the body you know in the human condition with the spirit in the flesh and that the only person that is going to change your life that is going to grant anyone their heart desire is you 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 are you when is watching this you anna me me you we're the only ones people you, people can come into your life your husband your children and they give you love they give you attention they might give you the things that you need but in reality the one that is going to be able to get everything you want from your heart it's us. It's one. I have to create the life that I want. How do I do that? I do it with my mind. Watch my thoughts. Every night when I go to bed, before I am falling asleep, I'm trying to envision the life that I'm creating. Forget all the negative stuff that are happening. No, that doesn't matter. They belong in the past. If they're not here right now, they're not aligned with purpose. You see what I mean? If something is not happening in your life right now, it means it's not aligned with your life purpose. So you just have to move on and open yourself to the things that you're going to receive from your divine because they're aligned with the purpose of what you want to do in life. And that's to me, is mindfulness. It'd be fully present, accepting things that they are and moving on to your next moment and letting go. Free yourself from the suffering. Free yourself from the desire that is causing you the anxiety the depression, being upset. And when we do that, that's when we find the freedom to be happy, to be here now, fully present. We understand how life goes, how we process life. And then you just go about in living the purpose-driven life that you want. Honestly, that's simple. It sounds simple and it's doable. So, Anna, I, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you're sharing your life story with us. I know that's a very... Uh, admirable place to be because not everybody is this vulnerable. Not everybody is uh, open themselves to share their pain, their suffering, for the very same reason that you talked about. They're afraid to be uh, labeled the stigma. When in reality, mental health, there's no stigma about. You know what is mental health? That your brain, your mind is out of control. The monkey in the cage, <laughs> your mind is out of control, and you gotta feed the monkey. You got to feed the monkey. And how you feed the monkey? Let him be. Don't worry. Embrace the moment right now. So I know prayer works. I pray. 
I call them prayer meditation because I do both. I pray, I ask God, I talk to God, I call him different things. I call him my man, my my goddess, my divine, what what you might call it. Uh, sometimes my sense of humor, I, I, I like to believe that he's like a little Yoda. <laughs> I like to see the God as my little Yoda. That's that's uh, what I think of the divine. He's my little Yoda inside of funny because I um this is a, it reminds me of, of something um when I was a kid um I had a chance to spend two months in a Hare Krishna um camp and not just any camp but it was the new new Verbridian it was when it was a brand new look up Palace of Gold um I was there before it opened up wow um, and I was about eight or nine um uh, and I remember talk about having an eye-opening experience. Uh, they they think with full colors all the time, and and like they have like eight foot you know wide stained glass windows and a hallway. And I got to help put on uh, gold leaf on the temple um, when they worshipped. It had to do with. You're talking about baby yoda it was funny they have these things that look like dolls um it's a uh, krishna and his wife um and uh, i i, I want to say the right names so i don't i don't know which names they were but they were the blue ones um the blue deities and and what they have is they have the the two deities that they would greet in the morning in their pajamas and they had a whole like ceremony where they would you know open up the curtains and they're like in the jammies and and then they would close up the curtains and then they would dress the dolls and for their day clothes and they weren't dolls they were their deities <laughs> and they would offer they would open up the curtain and it was like early theater for me because i'd never seen anything really like that they'd open up this curtain and there's these two deities they're decked out in all kinds of silks and gold and pearls and all this stuff. And then they'd offer all these food things to, to them that were actually the offerings of what they had made for everybody that was going to eat that day. The, 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 the God and the goddess would get, you know, the, 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 a nice plating of, of everything. And, and so there was all this stuff and there was like worship, like their worship is completely different than the Christian worship because they had these little finger symbols and these yeah. drums that I've never heard of. And this little, it's like a teeny thing. And it's like it's a little teeny sound that like cuts through everything. You're like, wow, what is that about? And, and then you put, you would put your hand through flame and you had to learn where to do that so you don't get burned. But there was something to that. And I didn't know what it was, but when you're like eight, and like there's color and flowers and flame and sounds and music. And you're like, whoa, you know, that was like, I had been to Catholic school and this was nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lisa, yeah. I, I, that, when I, like I said, when I was growing up, I, I remember there was this church in particular that I loved the lady. She was my second floor neighbor. Her name was... I, I hope she's still alive. I lost track of her since age 12. I don't even remember her last name, but her name was Le her name was Leonora. And she was a very, the kind of Pentecostal, the practice, they don't put makeup, they wear their long mm. uh, uh, skirts are below the knee, that sort mm -hmm. of very, you know, women's just yeah. Uh, yeah. And she used to take me to her church. I didn't kill off from the church uh, service because, honest to God, as a six, eight year old, I, it was frightening to me because the stuff they will say, and now as an adult, I understand the stuff they will say and shout out people and yelling when they were screaming. It was almost like they were terrorizing the congregation as to be afraid because of the scene and get out there and behave and. Don't be a sinner because otherwise you're going to rot in her. Uh, the devil is going to come and get you and you're a bad person. And I literally, I can close my eyes and listen to all that shouting for those people on stage and literally will be trembling on the puke because I really believe 
And that's when I realized now as an adult that I read about religions and I try to learn because a lot of my clients come from different backgrounds. So when I'm trying to teach them about mindfulness, about what is to be fully present and living in the spirit, it is natural that their life story or whatever was conditioning that they grew up, uh, social strata, education, ethnic identity, culture, all that and religious belief and cultural norms are going to come to place. So I have to be very mindful when I approach the clients, when they're opening up to me, how we talk about religion, because um, the first thing that we have to do is just detach them from that. Learn to honor thyself. Learn to honor the thy spirit in you. You don't have to listen to anyone to tell you that you got to go seek God outside of you or that you're going to rot in hell if you're not a good Christian, that sort of thing. I but, used to tell my kids that that uh, God is as close to you as your own breath. So I yes, have to breathe. That's what it is. And yes. he, you know, he's that close. Yes. So it isn't yes. like you have to go hunt no, it down. No, no. It's right there. No, the divine. That's why the, 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 lo the logos, the, the, the Bible means God breathe. Yes. And it's so funny that we have to understand something that, to me, I am very honored that the divine in me has given me. When I said intelligence, I'm not necessarily talking about an intelligent people person. Intelligent is like, let's say, the military, the Navy, the CIA, the FBI. What do they do? They gather intelligence in order to learn about the next strategic approach to whatever they're working on. So when I use that word intelligent, I use it in the same context. I talk about in intelligence, about consciousness there's an intelligence inside of us oh. that it has nothing to do with any kind of religion formation it's just it it is that spirit that lives in us so when i talk to anyone that said to me oh my god yvonne you i have a lot of christian people that has said to me lately which i think is funny because i used to listen to that word as a child when i went to those different churches agua viva which means the spirit uh oh okay Agua viva means like when you have this joy in your in your heart that to me is like yo tengo un gozo en mi alma, I have this joy in my soul. It's just because I am, I'm fully present. That doesn't mean that I am immune to everything of the life stories and life experience are happening. Oh no, I cry, I suffer, I get angry. More likely I at the time, I act out of grace because that's what we do. We are a duality. We are not saint. But the ability for us to be the spirit in the flesh is to be able to command that spirit all the time within us and say, here I am. I am present. I am the divine. And I always tell my clients, well, whenever you're running into challenge, ask yourself within your religious belief, what will Jesus do? What God will do? You know what God will do? He'll tell you, love yourself because I love you. Love yourself enough to forgive yourself, not to be so hard on yourself. That it is okay that whatever you experience, hey, shit happened, you know, no big deal. Poo poo happens, caca happens. There's nothing wrong with that. You just pick up yourself, dust the poo poo away, clean up the poo poo or the caca, and you keep moving forward. Because life doesn't end that day that you got all the caca. No, that's just a moment, it's just a transition. And as hard as it is, you just very, humble, you say, well, what is my lesson to learn from this experience? And you'll see that that divine will open to you. I will demonstrate exactly. All right. I see. And then move on. That's, but every day, this is a lifestyle. It's just not something you do once. Oh, I'm cured. I'm done. I'm all I'm mindful and expert. No, this is something that you do just at a, every second. It's very difficult, but you can do it. Anybody can do it. And I would like you to invite you to do that. Anna. Would you consider doing mindfulness? Getting to some kind of mindful um, approach to try to see uh, if I can help uh, manage all the mental health challenges at times? Does that sound something that you would like to consider, like mindfulness? See how that yeah, might help? I you? mean, it, it sounds like it's, it's weird. It, it, it sounds like something I. I could do easily if I remembered to do it. It, <laughs> it. No, honestly, when people are like, oh, you have to breathe. I'm like, oh yeah, that. Like, <laughs> I, I forget to breathe, like to not breathe up here because it's all like right. fear. You have to breathe down in your 
gut because yes. it's that's the better breath. Yeah. And I forget to do that. <laughs> <laughs> There's every, no, like, that's, how it was for me. Yeah. It, that's how it is for every person that is learning. And if, if, if you like, we can try one minute. We can do that. We can try one minute. I can show you. Okay. And um, um, see, let me, I'm looking for my clock, my thing. So I can put a time if we're going to do it because it's very easy, Anna. Um, give me a moment. Oops. Every time I want to do this. Oh, oh, how do, oh, one minute. Yeah. Yes. So when I try to, when I'm working with people trying to help them meditate, basically, so I just said, let's sit down straight. Let's do that right now. I have some cords. I know I am. Um, the tech struggles, real folks. No, which is okay. I am, um, and I. This is something you can do on your own later, but it's just to give you an idea. Very simple. I don't want to get. But I'm gonna put just one minute, and I'm gonna tell you when we're gonna start. I, I got the clock ready, the timer. So I want to explain to you right away. To just sit straight. Try to relax your shoulder. Don't hunch. Okay. Just what I do when I to put my shoulders straight or my chest, I just kind of lift my chest and I throw them back. Not comfortable. I just get comfortable. I don't want to do force like this, but then we feel unnatural. Just throw the shoulders back. The posture in general. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be a perfect posture either. Just kind of sit straight. Uh, put your hands like this on your thigh with palms up. And just okay. leave them open. You don't. This is later when you start becoming more. I'm gonna take off this earring because it's yes, bugging okay. me. And, and basically, we're going to try the one-minute exercise. And this minute exercise is just designed for you to focus on your breath. And don't worry about the thoughts that come into your mind. Acknowledge them and let them go. Let, let them kind of like see for what they are and just continue breathing. <laughs> that's okay. Sometimes, actually, that's very natural. <laughs> that whenever you're going to start that you want to be in silence or meditate or even pray. Don't you start yawning? Isn't that funny? That's yeah. a natural response of the body that is about to get to relax, you know? So we're going to see straight. The way I start breathing, and I'm going to show you right away, and then I'll tell you we're going to be ready. You're going to take the breath. This I'm one? Do, no, 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 no. We're going to look look at me. I'm going gonna, gonna to when I'm ready. But basically, we're gonna, I'm going to take a deep breath in three. One, two, three. I'm taking the one, two, three. A four, I hold it. So I go like one. I'm gonna do it without counting, but I'll show you what I'm doing. I just want you to watch me. I want you to watch me. See what I do. I go like this. I'm ready now. So I take a breath. I zoom on, I inhale in three. One, two, three. On fourth, I hold it for fractions of a few a second. Not a second. I just fractions. I go. One, two, three. Hold it. So I do one, two, three. Taking the breath. One, two, three. Hold it. Then four, five, six, seven, even eight. I let it go. So basically, you're taking the breath on three, on three counts. At the fourth count, you hold it. And then at five, six, seven, eight, you breathe out. You exhale. Mm. And that's okay. That's perfect because that's exactly that I used to be whenever I started. That's how we start. That's I actually that's yawn so hard. Something <laughs> in my chin pulled. I'm just like a muscle cramp. I'm just trying to... awesome. oh, okay. so, no, anyway, so basically, this is how we do. Take a deep breath. One, two, three. Hold it. Four. And then you hold, hold it. No long, you don't want to. Oh, like, they just hold it natural and don't and just natural. Take a deep breath. So we're gonna do that for one minute. Do you want to try by yourself? One, just one. See if, if you can do it. I did it with you. I, you did it? Okay, I, good. I just closed my eyes, I just didn't see you. But okay. All right. So are you ready? We're gonna do it. So, ladies and gentlemen, for the first time. Anna Rouseville D'Onofrio is going to be trying <laughs> sort of meditation with me, with Yvonne. It's let one me, minute. Let me, uh, let me post more. Okay. All right. So 
I have another friend who's been trying to teach me how to breathe for years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you got that. So we're gonna start and say one, two, three. Now, Stop. How was that? It was good. So where, how, how did you feel? What was in your mind when you were doing it? Um, just focusing on the counts for a little while. And then, oh, gee, I took a really big breath. What do I do now? And then let it out slow. Um, but then the... the the moment to breathe back in again, like, like I just tried not to think to overthink it and just like, it's okay. Yeah. Just breathe normal. Right. Yeah. Did anything come oh. into your mind? No. About your life which, story? which for me is actually good because sometimes a little quiet's nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't see anything in your canvas, in your movie. No. Yes. <laughs> That's exactly the space that you need to get every time you do this. You want to empty your mind. And the more you do that, Anna, that you're going to start seeing that the life story of the thoughts that you're creating, you can actually, poof, like Chazam, disappear. Because then you see in reality, oh, shit, I'm the one that is making the life story. Mm. And I, I want to change my movie. I want to become a better movie producer. <laughs> yep. Wasn't that great, though? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that I, so you actually felt that your mind was empty. Oh yeah. And that was just one minute. Can you imagine? And you start practicing this every day, little by little in an hour, go to the bathroom, close the door. The people believe that you're busy doing your business, sit in the toilet, in the edge of the shower, I don't like on the bathtub and do it. Find yourself a space to declutter your mind, to empty the garbage can. When I said the garbage can, it's all the junk that we think about. Mm -hmm. This was great, Anna. Thank you. Uh, right. you is it, this is something that you can use to help your son whenever he's experiencing anxiety and frustration. Yeah. He will be open yeah. up to try it. Yeah. I think, you know, he probably has heard more about it than I have because he's been to North Carolina and there's various um, hippie communities out there. So <laughs> hippie <laughs> communities. <laughs> No. Disclaimer, I'm not a hippie. <laughs> but I like hippies, way. by the way. Yeah, my mom was my mom's a recovering hippie, more or less. Oh. Like, you know, like she um she you know, she knew flower people and that's how I, we got to uh New Viridian because she knew people that were there. And she asked my brother and I, Do you wanna you wanna go do you wanna go to school anymore? And we're like, yeah. So <laughs> so she knew some people, that's how we got there. So Yes. But that was West Virginia, so uh, North Carolina is probably a different vibe. But he liked it. So, yeah, I think you can get down with that, yeah. You know, I love that Stephen has joined us. and He has shared so many comments because I know he's into mindfulness mm -hmm. and the present moment. So thank you, Stephen, for supporting us and yeah. doing this conversation. And I hope that everyone that has tuned in and are listening and getting something of value of uh, this conversation, this between Anna and I. And is there anything else that you would like to share? Um. I actually, uh, for example, I got here, let me find it, that I did when I was preparing all banners. I um, found the website. For example, if anyone that is watching this show and are tuning later or do the replay and are interesting 
and getting more information about they can get assistance or, or information about mental health. Here's the website of the, our mentalhealth.gov. Uh, I checked it out this morning and they have all kinds of information. They also have the suicide prevention hotline that I'm sharing right now here. And don't be afraid to call them because they're actually good people. Um, a friend of mine uh, last year tried to kill herself and actually she was thinking about it and wanted to talk to somebody. So we talked to somebody on speakerphone on my phone in her car. And um, if we had done what they said, it would have probably been a better day for her. Um, she didn't want, they suggested going straight to the clinic um, and she wanted to go home first. Um, little, I didn't realize that she had a plan and uh, had some uh, a big old handful of pills. And I was there in the house and her son called and I handed the phone to, to her and she's like, oh, nice to hear from you. You kept me from taking the other handful of pills. Oh, the other handful of pills, right then. So I called, uh, I, I, I just, I didn't even think right then, I just called uh, 911 and went from there. But um, uh, the ambulance came to the house, the police came to the house before that, that they stayed on the line with me. Um, and my friend is still alive, which is why I have this ring, because I went and I wanted to celebrate it, that my friend was still alive. So I bought myself that ring. Um, wow. So, so that was in here, no, Anna. And this is the same person, I believe, that you share with me, that you're still working with her. You're giving her some kind of emotional support yeah, I'm a to make I'm sure that she gets out of this this deep uh, abyss that she's right now. Well, she's she's uh, she needed somebody to help distract her from just being by herself all the time. So I'm actually her mental health support person. Um, so I go in a couple times a week and keep her company for a few hours and we do some, acti you know, any activities that she has on, on hand that she wants to have some help with or she just wants to sit and talk or, you know, watch TV together or something. Usually we talk and maybe do a little something, maybe go out to lunch or something, but um, it's to keep her mind out of, keep her out of roaming around in her mind by herself. Now, let me ask you something. Is this is something that her current uh, health, uh, mental health professionals that are working with her, that they recommend her to do? If, or this is something that you out of got kindness and goodness. She actually heart. had one, she had, a, she had a, a support person before that, um, but because of COVID, her support person um, was also a home health aide for someone who was about 90, so was in the uh, age bracket that would have been susceptible to COVID. So that other mental health person uh, is keeping to herself and just working with this one client so okay. that they don't expose her further. So she didn't want to expose herself further by working more with, with my friend. So that's why I'm working with her um, a couple of days a week. So this was something that she started on her own. It wasn't because the health professional set it off for her. I don't know if somebody suggested it or if she came up with it or how. I, I don't know if it was an idea that they worked together with her because uh, she has therapy and uh, a therapist and um, she's doing the DBA and everything. I don't know where the idea originated from. I just know that that was something that she asked me to do for her, so I do. Well, it's funny. I'm just listening to you, and you just, honestly, that's almost like the beginning of a new career, of a new business, that there you are as a support person. That's because sometimes many people that are struggling with mental health challenges is about loneliness. So there you are giving her love, attention, companionship, in ensuring that this person feel that she has a support system and she's surrounded by people, people that care for her. So it goes to show you the need that is out there for people that are struggling with mental health issues and they're feeling very lonely. So if there are providers out there that are listening to this or very play or if a family member that is going through mental health, uh, seek that kind of assistance. I'm not sure that if in assistant, but Anna, you, 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 you could be starting the beginning of a new trend because that's that's wonderful that you're there, you're available for her, you're busy with her. How many times you go? Twice a week or? Twice a week. That's excellent. And how is she doing now? She's doing better? She's doing good. Yeah, she's doing better. 
you see something so as she had, she had a rough patch for a while there because of covid she uh she she hadn't been exposed to any people for a long long time and uh and she's an extrovert so people look in on your extrovert friends they're not okay <laughs> So while you were talking, I actually shared the the number for uh, the treatment and referral hotline nice. for you know for mental health. I also have the one for veterans. So as you know, we do have a lot of veterans that they struggle uh, with mental health challenges due to whatever they experience in their tour of duty. So many of them come with a lot of these challenges. So I'm sharing the number. And um, do you have one for NAMI? I actually did. Uh, I didn't get the chance to do that one. I mean, but if you uh, want to share, please put it in the uh, comments and I'll put it up. Yeah, I'll look it up to see. Uh, N A M I M. Try spelling. I'm so relaxed, I can't spell. Thanks. Let me see if I can see it really quick here. It's just I'm, I am such a senior. I need to wear my glasses so I can see. <laughs> Well, I gotta get me is there Anna, is there glasses online? No, no, my husband he was tickling me. It's like over there. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have bifocal, so I, I know what you mean. Yeah. want to come in the show and say something. <laughs> but it's so funny. These glasses, you see, are the regular glasses, but because of the reflection of the glare, um, I can really um, but I need to see them, otherwise I won't be able to see the comments. There's right. one that you can get with a uh, anti-glare uh protective pro uh, coating. You can get that uh, <laughs> Uh, so you share the NAMI? Okay, let me see. I know I think we have something about NAMI. Let's do that. That was a great I think idea. it's uh, like it's a National Association of Mental something. Yeah, let's see. Oh, and then here's somebody here that mentioned. That's Dori Dori. She's actually checking in from Italy. Hi, Dori. Oh, hi, Dori Dori. Buongiorno, uh, principesca. No. I think she's actually from Japan and is living in Italy. Or I was so going to get that right. Yeah, something like that. Like she's somewhere from Asia, and now she's living in Italy. And she went to the same college that I go to, um, and she knows some of the people in my church. So hi, Dory. Thank church. you for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Actually, my daughter-in-law is Japanese. I love her name, Dory Dory. That's so cute. That great. It's a cute name. <laughs> so we have here yeah. Moon Shadow Machado. Yeah, I don't and, know if she's here or if I. I remember I I I painted him, but I don't know if that was here. Yeah, I was oh. doing it out of love, but I can see how it could develop into a thing, like if people needed it. Right. But I don't know how often I could do it for other people because I still have. But you, even if you open your home. business, it's like me, Anna. I have my business uh, now and I work from home, but I don't work all the time. I, yeah. I, I have to manage my lifestyle. So yeah. you can do the same. But I think you are you're onto something, girl. The coming curator does a business, boom. The fact that you're providing companionship for a lot of these uh, elderly senior people, friends that are alone. It's just one person, right? And she's not even elderly. She's she's actually the same age as you. She just has, she's dealing with a mental. Hi, Dory. It's funny, about, like, you're asking if I have mental, you know, health issues in my, in my family. She's my best friend. And actually, I went through the whole mental health thing first before she did. So she's i'm one of the few people in her life that gets it from the inside yeah. out because i did the therapy i did the medicine and she's like my she, she's the, i'm the only one that she can ask like you know did this one make you feel like this and generally if i can remember the medicine i can tell her but you know she's seen me be all numbed out and stuff so yeah no and especially you have had such an experience going through yourself that you're in the best position to having that frame of reference, to have the empathy, to be able to relate to her and actually serve her as a guide, even to say, hey, this too shall pass. We mm -hmm. go through this tough moment, but if you bear with this moment, it too shall pass. So, yeah. Anna, that's, that's very kind of you, very generous. And... That's what I wanted to do with this with you. You're such a special person. You do so many things for people out there. And no one that will meet you ever will think that you struggle with all this challenge. And there you are, thriving, beautiful, intelligent, sharing, even helping me. Because when it comes to this techie stuff, trust me, 
I am at an infant level, but thanks to us. But you're getting there. You, you, you're doing it yourself and even off site now. So you're doing great. Yeah. I'm just, you know, the spirit, you know, the spirit in me, the divine in me say, what are you afraid of? And I stare back at him and said, yeah, that's right. What are you afraid of? <laughs> I have this internal dialogue with my own uh, spirituality. Because so that's right. What are you afraid of? Who's saying mm. no? And I actually said to myself, that's right. Who who am I listening to? And I said, sorry, mea culpa, my bad. I'll be good. You know, I'm here. <laughs> give it to me. Give it to me. But this is not something uh, that I just learned overnight. It's just one day, maybe five, seven years ago, approximately, I really woke, woke up. Woke up because since I was young, I always had that gift of discernment. Or even when I didn't know that I have it, that you have, everybody else, Dory has it, everybody in the world. We all have the same skills and abilities. When oh, different people have different kinds of giftings. Like I know that when we're our church, our first church, when I, my first church was having revival, I could sense when somebody was having a hard time of it before the pastors saw it. So I would see that it was like spiritual triage. Like everyone was laid out on the floor because they're slaying the spirit. And I would be like, um, and, and they would do something and there was some deliverance that would happen. And I didn't do all that. I just sensed when something was wrong and like a spiritual nurse, I'm like, okay, um, somebody might want to do something about this, you know, and they do. And, and it worked and it was great. And that was like, 20 some odd years ago and and there's been lasting fruit from them and some people have a gift of prophecy exactly. and some people have a gift of healing um and there's there's just there's just different gifts and some people have a lot of giftings but yes oh i have made people that have the ability to read to see your energy your chakra the colors of your chakra the kind of energy that you're emanating from you and it is so funny whenever any one of my clients tell me, well, what are the chakras? And I said, they're the, col the, the, the colors of the rainbow in you. And we mm -hmm. go through different stages of seeing that rainbow because mm -hmm. it affects different parts of our body. Our my mom. mom can do that. She, what she does is she can tell that different people sparkle different. There you go. And uh, there's people that have the gift of discernment, which is basically knowing the handy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And we all have it. The problem or the challenge that we humans have in harnessing or actually use the gift of discernment of those gifts and talents that we have in the spirit is because our spirit is too imprisoned with the narrative and the life story that we are living in the world. And we don't have any kind of faith to believe that, hey, that's just a story that I'm making. I have to be fully present here now honoring the spirit that's what this is all about anna that when i say to me what is my gift well my gift is that i honor as much as i can to be fully present in this moment honoring the divine essence in me um, by the virtue of that it gives you the gift of discernment by either being a clairsentient a clairvoyant uh, all kinds of psychic stability we all have it intuition is the most important them of all because intuition is a spirit in you trying to guide you that intuition in spanish i call it un yo no sé qué. you feel something a fire in your belly whatever you want to call it but it's intuition that is guiding you teaching you the way either it's telling you stop proceed go on abort but your intuition is your compass is your moral compass is your guidance. So whenever you feel a little bit of that, un yo no sé qué, a fire in your belly, something that is trying to speak to you, and you in your mind, you're saying, oh, no, it's not that. Oh, it's just me thinking. Heed to it. Because that's yeah. your mind, the spirit in you, and the image and liking of that divinity that we're created speaking to you. Or even like if you, like, some people think that prayer is all, complicated and stuff but like no, prayers like are god, prayers. Listens, god listens to like to children's prayers i think he yeah. listens to all our prayers but like i remember like my first real prayer was i wanted to have my brother and i stay together when we were um at the processing place uh in the middle of the night um before we were sent to our first foster home and i begged them to keep us together because i had this urgency this feeling like if we were to be separated he would die it was that urgent and I was like nine and so I was just 
you know, basically begging them to keep us together, and they did. So I was one of those rare families where my brother got to be in the same foster home as me because of that prayer. It's funny because um, prayer is basically you allowing the divine to speak to you because you are surrendering to that absolute faith and belief. So all, the only thing missing, I always say to people when you're praying, is like believe that you are the divine, that you're actually having a commune, you're communing, you're communicating with the God in you, in, in helping you to free yourself from the prison of your mind, of the life story that your thoughts are creating, the imagination, and communing and praying and meditating is doing that, having a communication with your moral compass, with your moral guidance, with your spirit self, with your higher self that is actually guiding you as to what is the, to feel what is the right thing to do or how to proceed or where to go when in terms of making decisions. So your intuition is very important, not because it's just something that is called intuition. No, your intuition is the God in you. I truly believe that, Anna. I mean, I it might sound crazy, whatever. No, I truly believe that. So when people address me and they say, you want, you have this energy, you have this present, you're always joyful. Even when your life is going in for whatever reason, in terms of any life challenge, I am present. I'm like, bring it on. I am ready. Watch the next 60 seconds. This can last. There's no ill that can last 100 years and a body that can sustain it. That's the saying that we say in Spanish. Que nosotros decimos que no hay mar que dure por 100 años y cuerpo que lo resista. It's the same thing. The divine is not going to give you anything that you are not designed or have the skill sets ability uh, to overcome it. That is one of the most absolute tenets and principles of the divinity. The divine is not going to give you or me or anyone in the world anything that they have. They don't have the skill or are designed to handle it. We can do everything that life offers to us. What we need to ensure is. Right. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that one. Exactly. Yeah. And it is yeah. the same thing. Be present. It's the spirit. That's what it means, uh, Anna. That's what mindfulness is. So um, I think we should be wrapping up this morning. Yeah. It feels like it. Hey, yeah, it's, believe it or not, we've done two hours. We had a little bit yeah. of a start because we ran into some technical difficulty. But this was a conversation that it was needed to be shared. And uh, we're so fortunate that Anna was, was so willing and generous to want to share our stories with us. And basically, we're destigmatizing this mental health challenge because mindfulness is mental health. So is there anything else that you would like to leave people, Anna, from this conversation before we wrap up for the day? I think like maybe two things. One, <laughs> and they might be the same coin. Um, one, don't be afraid to be broken. Um, Beautiful. Sometimes people need to see that you're not as pulled together as, as you want to be um and that vulnerability to be seen while being broken is a gift that you give them and and two um don't be afraid to receive help and help could be you know a cup of coffee from somebody who just felt like giving you a cup of coffee or you know like receiving is a skill and it's humbling it, it, it can be humbling because all of a sudden you're in a position where you're not in a position of strength where you're giving to other people, but you have to be receiving it. And I went through a big season. We went through a big season of that when my husband had brain surgery. Um, that was part of the reason why I went manic the second time because my rock at the time was my husband um, was falling down. That was a problem <laughs> and he couldn't work. And so that Christmas, we had to receive a lot of Christmas presents from people that we didn't know, um, but who wanted to give us things. And um, that was really great because to know that you don't have to do it all and you don't have to be it all and you don't have to have everything perfect. Um, and sometimes you just can't. And then that 
God shows up in the form of people who have gift baskets and food baskets and um, exactly. want to give you a winter coat or something. We've received all those things. And so be broken and be willing to receive. I think those are the two biggies. That kind of, there was probably a third, but it kind of evaporated. So <laughs> that's okay. If you think about it later, just add it in the comments. Okay. This is great, Anna. But did you see how, when you were mentioning how your fellow people that were coming to give you guys all the love and support, that's all the little Jesus, the little God in people in them, presenting their divinity in them. Because right. they heard, like, you know, like we did at one point, we had a, a wish list that we had for our local church. But that people actually stepped up and and helped us. We, I have a stove because one point my husband reached out to the church because we had a broken oven or stuff something, and it was like 50 years old, and and we just needed a new one. And so somebody actually went and found one online or something and and bought it, and the church shipped in the money, and and somebody cleaned it, and somebody else cooked in it, and. I came home from work that day and and we had a, a fully cooked meal and I was was like, huh? Because I wasn't expecting that because I figured that was the problem I had to deal with. But it, it was it was fixed. It was it was it was not just fixed, it was replaced. Like there were there was a different whole stove there. Same make and model, different color. It was no longer <laughs> avocado green. It was <laughs> it's white, you know, but like just be open to people wanting to give and minister to you. And Amen. even though it's uncomfortable sometimes, just get past your own ego and self and just exactly. let people love on you. Yes. Anna, those are beautiful words. I thank you for sharing your story with us this morning. I learned a lot. Um, hope that Anna's story in any way, shape or form is there anyone that gets to listen to this uh, um, talk? I put the numbers up in the screen. If anyone is struggling with mental health challenges, for them to reach out to their communities um, and the agencies that provide those services. Don't suffer alone. And is there anything that I can leave you with? Embrace mindfulness. Find out what is mindfulness. Get curious about mindfulness. It's like a new trend. What is in it for me, mindfulness? I will approach it that way, Anna. What is in, in it for me, mindfulness? Because there's a lot of benefits to it. And I think you're doing great. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I you. honor you. I honor you immensely. You're a light and a blessing in my life. <laughs> Thank you for sharing this story with us. And... Um, if you want to say something before you go really quick. I'm good. You're good? Peace so, out. <laughs> peace out. Thank you, everybody. Have a blessed and great day. Remember, your life is happening here right now in this moment, fully present. If you don't understand what is, oh, be present, being in the moment, is to honor the life essence, your spirit, your life force within you, just like Star Trek, you know? May the force be, I'm no, no, Star Wars, may the force be with you. That means and you, you know, did you know that this is actually, did you know that this is derived from an, uh, uh, from a, this is derived from a, a, a Jewish blessing? No, that's where Star got it from. It's that, really? yeah, it's when go. that's the benediction of the, the Jewish rabbi at the oh, end no. of their service or what have you. They do, it, he does that over oh, the, I just learned the, something new. It's so funny because, yeah, it's, do you know what just came to mind? This is crazy. Just now, as you were doing this, and I was trying to put my fingers, and I realized this tool was not gluing. <laughs> no, honest to God, this is It happens. Crazy. It's a thing. It, 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 people get it or they don't. Like, back, remember work from work? Yeah, that was Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. It just happened to me. I'm kidding. You know, as I was trying to do that, I was, for my, I'm, I know I'm, I'm, I'm live, and I'm doing this. I'm looking at my hands, trying to get the fingers to kind of do the thing. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God, you know who just came through in the image in my mind as I was doing that? Are you ready for this one? I saw Jesus. Remember when Jesus, the sacred heart of Jesus, where he's standing mm -hmm. and he his hands like this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what it came to me. Oh, just, yeah, yeah. 
Amen. Hallelujah. You see, that's how the Spirit speaks, Anna. As I was doing that with you, that's the image that came to my mind. Nice. I wasn't thinking about Jesus right now. I love Jesus. Jesus is me. Me and Jesus, the do were tight. <laughs> we got a thing going on. But anyway, when I was doing that, that's it, the image that presented me. Because if you look at the portraits of Jesus, how do you see him being portrayed? When he's standing like that with his hands, with a heart, you know, like this. He put his fingers yeah. like this. Yeah. Kind of. It's not. And he has like a, the orb in the hand, I think. Right. So when you said that, that you learned something from uh, some uh, Jewish. This is from the Jewish. This is the Jewish um, benediction. It goes to show you that we have more than we are like than we're not. And yeah. with that, my beautiful people that are watching and the ones that have tuned in to share this this great conversation with us, I thank you. I hope to see you the next time. Thank you, Anna. Stay blessed. Thank you for staying beautiful. And with this, have a blessed you. day. God bless you and see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs> Love you, Anna. Love you too. <laughs>